Hello, everyone. Welcome to this next session, How to Make the Most of Data in Value-Based Care. I'm thrilled today to be joined by executives well-versed in value-based care who will be sharing practical tools providers can leverage to make, a, to make the most of their organization's data. We'll also be talking broadly about the future of value-based care, its impact since COVID, and the role of leaders in this work. It's my pleasure to introduce our three esteemed panelists. First is Amy Anderson. She's the Industry Executive Director of Healthcare with Oracle. Amy has a deep history in strategy, policy, and regulatory compliance in transformational consulting, including with Kaiser Permanente, IBM, and Philips Healthcare. She began her career in Washington, D.C. as a health policy consultant and lobbyist and helped to craft the portability and privacy provisions of the landmark HIPAA law. She recently led strategy and established an industry partnership program for St Stanford University's Clinical Excellence Research Center, the only academic research institute focused solely on developing models of care that improve quality, access, and reduce the total cost of care. Amy, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. So our next panelist is Dr. Stephen Roop. Stephen Roop joined Intelligent Medical Objects in 2013 and now serves as the Chief Clinical Officer. He contributes a frontline user's perspective to IMO's executive team. He also leads a team of clinicians and non-clinicians designed to take a proactive approach to customer service and sales, both in the US and internationally. Steve, great to have you here. Thank you, my pleasure. And finally, we're joined by Dr. James Hamrick, Vice President of Clinical Oncology at Flatiron Health, where he leads a team of doctors, nurses, and informatics specialists who inform the development and applications of Flatiron products and services relied upon by frontline clinicians in hundreds of cancer clinics across the U.S. Thanks for being with us, uh, James. It's really great to have you. Thanks, Maria. Wonderful to be here. So each of you bring a really diverse perspective to the topic of value-based care. So I'm really excited for our discussion today and for each of your unique insights. So I wanted to start with level setting. So if each of you could talk about what are the challenges healthcare organizations are facing right now with value-based care on their journey. And if we could start with you, Steve. Sure. Um, I think one of the fundamental questions that needs to be uh, dealt with right out of the box is if we're going to engage in, in a value-based care uh, um, environment, it's very important that we have the ability to describe the patient accurately from a medical point of view. It seems like a simple point, but actually it's not. Think of it as the, the medical fingerprint, if you, if you will, of a patient. If, if our documentation, if our records keeping can't accurately describe how sick or not sick a patient is at the beginning of this relationship, then value-based care metrics down the line will be effective and they'll be inaccurate. And if we're going to look at it that way, we really need to approach this. And, and my bias is obviously first from an informatics point of view, that we have the appropriate language, clinical language, not necessarily administrative language, which the administrative code sets are very important as well, but we need to be able to allow the clinicians to speak in a structured way so that we could capture an accurate picture of who the patients are. Okay. James? Yeah, so I, I totally agree. You know, one of the more fascinating things I've I've learned since making the move from being a pure clinician to working also seeing patients, but also at a health technology company is the value of informatics. And that concept that Steve brought up of taking the way that clinicians talk and making it more understandable from a structured data standpoint. So crucial to understand what's actually happening at the front lines. You know, in oncology, um, we are absolutely not exempt from value-based uh, payment models. It's a real opportunity across the space. Some of the challenges that we see in oncology practices, we many of them use our software from Flatiron. Um, you know, there are so many different varieties of, uh, of plans that happen across payers. So as a single practice, you can be dealing with a huge number of payers and value-based care interventions and models. That becomes a real challenge because you can't, it's hard to create one workflow to solve for everything you need to do to succeed in those models. Um, a second big challenge is the the data, so understanding what's happening and whether the interventions that you're that you're incorporating at your practice are working depends largely on receiving things like claims data. And that's a challenge because there's often a lag there. So it's hard to tell in real time whether your interventions are working. It's also challenging to work with claims. That's not a skill set that most practices have or, or, or many practices can resource in-house. 
And so really learning to get the data in a timely way and then make something useful of it is a, is a big challenge. And then, you know, these are busy practices. I'm sure it's a, it, it's true across primary care and all the specialties, but um, oncology practices are super busy. And so doing something new, like adjusting to a value-based care uh, model, while people I think generally agree in concept and the value there, it's hard to get buy-in and it's competing against other things like implementing precision medicine uh, clinical trials, opportunities, coding challenges. So all of those thrown at busy practices are big challenges. Yeah, we'll be diving into that uh, topic. So thanks for bringing that up. So Amy, yeah. what are your thoughts? Sure. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with the points that James and Steve made. Uh, we're at a real watershed moment, I think, as it relates to uh, value-based care. And largely because uh, I think there are opportunities to really break down silos of data um, the way that healthcare has generally managed uh, data is through silos. We know this. And frankly, the majority of kind of the focus on data has really been around payment models, right? Mm -hmm. we're, so I think we're at a real opportunity now to really look at two things. One, patient centricity as a driver for how we develop systems of interoperability and operating across kind of the business and clinical functions of healthcare. And secondly, finally, really address not just leading with technology or data, but understanding the clinical workflow and, and frankly, you know, alleviating the burden on clinicians to practice medicine rather than, you know, having to um, sort of manage uh, or click throughs and fixed coding and things like that. So I think there's a real focus now, I hear this from our customers, they're looking at ways to break down those silos, operate effectively, not at, you know, across the business functions and clinical functions. And I think that's a, you know, that's a real positive for uh, where we're gonna go from this disruption today. So Amy, I wanna dig a little deeper into this uh, concept of administrative burden. Um, so how have the challenges with data impacted administrative burden for our healthcare workers and in turn, the transition to value? Kind of what experiences have you seen in your work? Well, I think, um, you know, I've heard, I've heard this for years and years. And, um, you know, my previous life at Kaiser Permanente, I worked on the clinician side, the Permanente Medical Group. And time and time of, again, there would be uh, efforts to roll out uh, some sort of technology to quote unquote, you know, improve outcomes, improve uh, quality of care, improve effectiveness and efficiencies. And the physicians were not necessarily at the table. And so I would say, how are we going to implement this? We really need to think about how this can enable uh, clinical practice, engaging with communities, right, and patients. And so, you know, that was years ago, but I think that concept of not leading just with tech or frankly, a lot of what we've seen from, you know, digital health has almost, um, you know, tried to deliver on this hubris of, we know how to practice medicine better than doctors, right? You can't do that. So I've seen the burdens, the specific burdens on, you know, um, kind of the, what I mentioned earlier about silos of data. So clinicians end up having to um, spend additional time outside of their clinic hours fixing coding or focusing on, um, you know, manual kind of pre-authorizations or, or um, you know, emailing other clinicians rather than having that at their fingertips to support the true collaboration, um, you know, across specialties and engaging with their patients. Um, so here's why I think we're at an interesting time there is more of a recognition of the importance of that addressing that burden on physicians and other clinicians. Um, and, and largely because of the overall workforce challenges that are happening in healthcare. So I think this is being seen at the, at the senior levels um, in, in the C-suite and healthcare provider organizations that uh, if they're going to look at, you know, kind of efficiency and data integration, they have to, they have to primarily understand how this can enable clinical excellence and, and clinical practice. 
James, I'd love to get your thoughts on this from an oncology practice perspective. So what have you seen in terms of administrative burden and how that's been impacting the transition to value? Yeah, so I, you know, I would really echo what Amy said about the, the, the critical moment we're in to understand clinician workflow. So at Flatiron, we work with our practices directly to produce point of care software. And we serve about 40% of the community oncology market. So a lot of doctors and most of my job is spent working with those doctors to make sure that the stuff that we're doing enables high quality care and works for them. Anything that does not fit nicely into a clinician's workflow, anything that slows them down is really a non-starter. And frankly, we can't afford to do that in the system because you know doctors are busy. And so we always think about minimizing both the clinical burden and the administrative burden. Um, one of the key areas that sort of drives everything in our opinion is decision support for treatment selection. So if you think about it, that's what oncologists do kind of day to day throughout the day is I understand a patient, I understand their tumor biology and I select a therapy for them. Mm -hmm. And then that drives so many of the other factors that figure into value-based care. So number one in oncology and any, any specialty that uses specialty drugs, a high part of the expense is the, is the drug cost. And so making sure you've selected the right drug and avoided the wrong drug is really important. Right. So we think about using technology, in our case, it's a decision support tool called Flatiron Assist that helps uh, surfaces in CCN and in oncology. Those are the standard for evidence-based guidelines um, so that, so that evidence-based treatment choices can be made. It nestles right into the clinician workflow. And if you think about it, treatment selection also drives the important outcomes, of course, overall survival, but also things like admission to the emergency room admission to the hospital, admission to the ICU. And these are big drivers of costs in oncology and in everything. We find that if we can, if we can provide a tool that allows the doctors to make good scientific decisions, it actually helps with administrative burden. It gives the administrators a window into how their docs are practicing. And that actually allows them to do their jobs a little bit better as well. Um, I'll also say that, Amy, I think you alluded to the tightening of the physician workforce and, and, the, and the clinical workforce coming out, of, um, coming out of the pandemic. That's really important that you create solutions that let everyone work at the top of their license. Um, one of the big bottlenecks that we're seeing now is sort of the support staff, physicians needing to do work that optimally be, would be done by support staff. So we think a lot about how patients flow through the clinic. Um, so that we can make sure that we're we're serving them because administrative burdens and and physician burdens increase when when workflows aren't smooth and when they're not supported. Yeah. Steve, Steve, what about you? What have absolutely. you seen in your work? Sure, absolutely. I I think to echo both what Amy and James said, the, notoriously or historically, the the clinical world and the administrative world have not played well together. Um, they just haven't. And we've been able to navigate around that for the most part, you know, you know, until until recently. It, it, it's very important now that we recognize, yes, there, there's there's uniqueness to the clinical workflow and there's languages that we speak and so on. But we can't deny that the importance of capturing the administrative code sets. It's how we keep the lights on. It's how we're going to do analysis. It's how we're going to do population health, SNOMED codes, ICD codes. These are, things are very, very important, but they were never designed um, to uh, capture clinical intent at the point of care. Uh, so therefore we need to find a way really to bridge these two worlds without making physicians the most overpaid data entry people in the world, because that's what, that's what we've become. And, we're, and frankly, we're not good at it. Right, right. And also, we're not, most physicians do not want to become experts in SNOMED or ICD. We have people who do that very, very well. There's, there's people like myself and James, who unfortunately probably spend a little more time buried in those code sets than we want to be. But the average physician um, doesn't need to know the, the rules of secondary coding and, and including secondary and tertiary ICD codes on a diagnosis. They want to practice medicine. They want to say what they need to say at the point of care in the language that they were taught in, in medical school and residency and at a level of specificity that is often not captured in those code sets. Yet at the same time, you know, it was brought up about dealing with claims data. We need to be able to bring these two worlds closer together. And uh, at times they've operated like, you know, oil and water, but we need to eliminate that and make sure that these two um, flow together nicely. 
really great nuggets of insight so far. So I wanted to transition to um, technology and data tools that healthcare organizations can use to be successful in value-based care programs. So I would love to hear from each of you what data technology tools are out there sh providers should be leveraging to drive success in these models. Can we start with you, James? Absolutely, yeah. So I alluded a minute ago to things that help doctors make better decisions. So um, we think about way, th there's a fair amount of variability in care. And I think this is probably not only true in oncology, but across other specialties. So, you know, when I'm practicing and seeing patients every Monday in the clinic, it's entirely possible that one of my colleagues right down the hall is seeing a very similar patient and they may select a different treatment option for that patient. Um, so, you know, we it's really important in oncology that all of the data be presented to the doctor during their regular workflow. So we are thinking a lot about, there's a lot of new sophisticated genomic testing that's happening in oncology, ways that we can make it easier for the doctor to order the right test in a quick way that doesn't require a lot of manual human work, looping in another team member, filling out this form or that form, making it an easy entry into the electronic medical record, having that data return in a useful and actionable way. We've all experienced that when you're sitting there in clinic and you need a key result and you can't get it, if we can build technology that allows us to order genomic profiling for a tumor to have it come back to us in a useful way and be findable, that can then power a decision support module that helps the doctor choose the right, the right chemotherapy. In addition, many of our practices have made the investment to offer clinical trials in there as part of their practice. So um, that's really crucial because that's how we learn how to better take care of patients down the road. Um, and we need tools that allow you to know right there when you're making the key treatment decision, hey, there's a standard of care option for my patient. There's also a clinical trial option for my patient because there's nothing worse than having trials open and missing opportunities to enroll patients. Um, we partner with NCCN to surface evidence-based uh, evidence decision support. Um, we use their content through a tool that's built into the clinician's workflow, and we think that it's a very it's a seamless experience, which respects what people are talking about. It. Doctors want to have the information they need to make the, the clinical decision that's right for their patient. The other thing that this does is it allows practice leads visibility into how their doctors are practicing. So, you know, I said a minute ago, it's possible my colleague down the hall may be seeing the same type of patient and doing something very different. It's really important in a value-based world to understand where the variations in care are so you can drive everyone to best practices. So we think a lot about not only the front-end tool, but the back-end reporting that gives people visibility so, so they can align everyone on high-value care. Amy, what about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, James, I love everything that you said, particularly around, you know, really looking at variation. And you can't look at variation of practice and elevate you know, the evidence-based, you know, practice across your, your organization if you don't have the, the tools to actually, um, you know, look at that from the enterprise standpoint. Yeah. So what I, I think what it, you know, I think that um, there's an interesting trend going on now um, that I'm sort of expressing as this expansion of the healthcare ecosystem. So traditionally we've looked at health systems, maybe they have their ambulatory care clinics, contract with other community providers. Um, and those sort of sets of data were bolted together and tried to integrate. I think if we really have a patient-centric view of care, including prevention, you know, and, and care, um, we need to have ways to expand and extend that data interoperability across a broader um, sort of ecosystem. And specifically, I think, you know, when I look at what some of our clients have done um, through the last two years is they've had to pivot. You know, traditionally they looked at these inpatient revenues as like the drivers of, of their sustainability, but now they've had to acquire community-based providers, look at standing up um, meaningful telehealth or virtual health or home care. And so I think that environment um, to be really meaningful needs to have an underlying infrastructure for data interoperability across 
business operations, financial claims, and and the clinical um, the the clinical data. Um, so one one thing that uh, we've been looking at from from an Oracle perspective is how can we support our traditional customers, health systems, in having that flexibility and extendability as they acquire other um, clinical practices, as they um, participate more proactively in, in kind of the public health space. And so I look at it as kind of what are the, what, what can these sort of foundational platforms like, you know, cloud, secure cloud integrated platforms provide as a, an ecosystem for these clinically um, relevant tools for value-based care. That's, that's kind of how I see it. You know, there's a ton of really great, you know, innovation going on in digital health. Um, but as a kind of point solution, they may not have the ability to kind of extend, you know, uh, and scale and be secure uh, for clinical information, private health information. So those yeah, are the things I, I focus on. If I can chime in for just a second, I mean, you called out a really good point, which is the consolidation of health systems and, and merging with clinical practices. And it's just so key to have visibility across across your entire enterprise. That's something we hear again and again, is how can I make sure that we're giving high quality care across the enterprise? It's such a crucial thing. And, and you know, de-siloing the data and making things more interoperable is key. Steve? So it, it's interesting um, when I look at the uh, the advances in technology, both from a data and a, uh, a platform and a hardware point of view, um, I like to think of it as how can we, as we advance, allow some of this to drop into the background a little bit more. I focus a lot more on restoring that doctor patient interaction that, that I think goes away a little bit when we're turned to the side or t uh, typing into a computer. You can't do a search in clinical informatics and not find you know 50 articles on NLP, AI, machine learning, and so on. But, but what is the point of all these things? It's, it's, it's using this technology to get back to where we were so that so that technology is now an assistant. I often joke that, that the EHR is, is slowly, hopefully becoming like a stethoscope to me. It's not a burden in the way, it's just another tool that I use to practice medicine. So as we advance, as we approach what I consider, you know, you know, the ambient room, the room that knows what's going on, that pays attention. So I, I get to the point, um, you know, where I can just speak to the patient. It's important that we have solutions that, as we've said over and over, understand what I'm saying, can structure it, can then relate it to the administrative and standard code sets that are out there, but then can paint a, a, a picture of what happened. And then, of course, interoperability, as, as both Amy and, and James, James heard the walls of what system we use should be irrelevant. Um, it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter to the patient and it doesn't matter to the patient. And everything that we're saying, I think if we go back to the, the, the days of, of Dr. Larry Weed, he'd finally be proud that the technology is catching up with the ability to live up to his, you know, focus on the patient, focus on the problems, and that's where it all should start. So I think that's where technology and, and, and these advancements need to take us. Steve, I love it. We we got pretty far in before any of us said AI or, or, uh, right. or and, he, and then you talked about it realistically when you did. Right. But I love what you said, Steve, because AI and, and NLP need to be in the service right. of the clinician and the clinician patient and caregiver I, I relationship. Think, I think if you speak to most physicians and, and I, I'm a per primary care physician uh, originally at birth, um, it, it really does need to, these things need to fade into the background. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and as they do that, um, we're, we're not in a business where we're wowed by, you know, amazing technology and spinning lights and so on. Really, we're having a conversation, a very serious conversation with people that's often difficult for people, um, you know, to approach and to have distractions and, and things going on where we're not completely engaged, I really think are detrimental um, to that engagement. Totally agree. So, uh, Steve, I want to talk about um, accurate code capture, which is obviously a backbone to value-based payment models and being accurately reimbursed. So how can healthcare providers ensure their EHRs are ac accurately capturing the correct code so they're in reimbursed appropriately in these models? What should their their first steps be? Right. So uh, obviously a, a, a topic very, very dear and, and, and near to me. And to me, the answer is kind of as we touched on is, 
to simply remove that burden from the clinician. Find a way to remove that burden from the clinician. Do not try to make them into coders. They just, they're not, we're not good at it. We don't think that way. And we've tra been trained a different way. Um, interface terminology is something that, you know, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time on. And really what the interface is, we say the word interface, we think of a black box with wires going in and out of it. That's not what we're referring to as, at all. I refer to interface terminology as the interface between the clinician's brain and the administrative world. We're thinking one thing, we want to say one thing, we want to communicate one thing. That's all I should have to do. Mm. At any level of specificity, that interface terminology should, should be able to capture that and preserve it. And as Amy talked about the interoperability, it's very important. If we abstract everything, so even if I used an interface terminology and I captured everything I wanted to say, but as we moved it around, we abstracted it to the best ICD code or the best group of Snellman codes, we would lose a lot of that information. It would be a it would not be a lossless situation as we move that data around and that's very important if we're going to demand from our clinicians to document with accuracy at the finest level of detail it's upon us as industry people to make sure that that's preserved not only within the system that we're in but as we move it around because you're not going to be able to take advantage of you know macro studies analytics population health value-based care if we cannot preserve that if we abstract everything to other disease X or unspecified disease X, we're not really saying anything. And every diabetic ends up looking the same um, and every heart failure patient ends up looking the same. So really it is so important that we get back to the clinicians saying what they wanna say, but it cannot be unstructured. It cannot be just dictating into a machine that stores it as a blob or as a PDF that the machine can't read and nobody else, if you have to manually go back and read. We have to turn it into structured data, allow the administrators to have those codes, but allow the clinicians to see the detail that was captured at the point of care, because every study shows that that's the most accurate place, not people going back and trying to divine what happened, but what's captured at the point of care is preserved throughout the entire um, continuum of care. Amy, do you have something to add? Yeah, Steve, you just got my wheels turning. Um, so I love what you said about how, how that should sort of go into the background for clinicians. I had a, a question. I've been having some conversations with folks in the industry lately about interoperability, and there's a real kind of frustration with how we've approached this, looking at, you know, kind of mar marrying to together data standards, right? Is there a role? Do you see a role in, let's say, AI uh, in, in really kind of taking us beyond that conversation and truly being able to um, extract the, the information that's necessary for administrative purposes, claims, clinical, while, while maintaining what's captured at the, and preserving what's captured at the um, point of care. Absolutely. And yeah. for purposes of this discussion, I think we could kind of merge AI and machine learning, although probably James is, you know, rolling over it. If I no, I'm good. <laughs> merge those two things together, but there's so, I don't want to sound arrogant as a clinician, but there is nuance to what we say. Yes. And if we're going to, if we're going to approach that, as you say, melt things into the background, the ambient room, which is, as I said, there's articles floating around about that, which is this nirvana that we should be approaching as, mm -hmm. as, as clinicians. An example that we often use is, is around something like temporality. If a patient comes in and says, this has been going on for about six months. Well, a computer that's not learning will take today's date and go back six months and say, that's when it started. But that's not what the patient meant, mm -hmm. right? We have to understand the nuances of, of temporality, of negation, you know, no history of, you know, coronary arteries, artery disease. Don't just look at the term. So these machines have to get smarter. They have to start to learn and listen and understand the way we speak. Um, so it's not just about NLP. NLP takes the words that we say and puts them on the screen. Siri does a great job about that. But what Siri can do and what these, these AI and machine learning systems have to do is start to understand what we're saying. Understand that about six months ago doesn't mean that you go from today and you subtract six months. It means you know a vague period in time that's less than a year, but more than a month. Mm -hmm. um, until we get to that, we're still gonna have to have some manual entry, some asking of these questions. And you're gonna always have you know people who are not as, as happy with the system and what it's captured. So I think there is a role for that. And I think as these things get better, 
I think of I think of AI engines as as teachers that need to become smarter. So we have we have teachers now that are operating at a fifth grade level and they'll become high school teachers and then college and then professors. And then these machines will really get to the point where they understand what the clinical world is saying. Awesome. So I want to switch gears a little bit to prior authorization. So, James. Um, insurance companies, you know, they have these specific evidence-based treatment options they support for reimbursement depending on the payment model. So can you talk about how that presents a challenge for healthcare providers and what a solution can be? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it actually does tie in with what we were just talking about, about taking the unstructured way doctors talk and structuring it uh, for a specific purpose. You know, so payers are interested, and, and I think everyone interested in cancer care is interested in practicing the best evidence-based medicine. Um, obviously, from a payer standpoint, um, they, they want their covered lives to get the best outcome possible. And they want to do it in the highest value way. And so guidelines and pathways are tools that are used in oncology and other specialties to, to, help, um, to help make sure that that, that, that happens. And so some of the things that they you know they want to select they want to make sure that the doctors are armed with the tools to select the correct therapy to do for instance a biosimilar replacement which can be a higher value option um to think about things like sites of service where you know it's much less expensive to get care in an outpatient center than it is um in a hospital setting um and and that's good the problem is there's still a lot of variation in the pathways so you know what one payer prefers may not be what another one prefers so when you're seeing a patient, you can, again, in clinic on Monday, I could see two patients with the exact same thing with two different payers, and the pathway could call for a different therapy because there are, at the end of these guidelines or pathways, sometimes more than one option that is reasonable from a safety and efficacy standpoint. What's interesting and where some of the opportunity that we just talked about and, and something we think about is you know, all of the criteria, all of the decision elements that a doctor is using to, to follow these pathways and make those choices are usually up here in our head. So I can say, Mrs. Jones is a 65 year old female with new diagnosis, non-small cell lung cancer, that's epidermal growth factor receptor positive. Now I need to make a treatment choice or look for a trial. That's all swimming around in my head. Um, in order to get that authorized and, and to show that you're concordant with a payer's pathway, each of those data elements needs to be captured and submitted as part of the prior auth process. It gets back to what Steve's talking about. I think like a doctor, I know this patient is in front of me, they got new lung cancer, they have a relevant biomarker, I need to make a choice. I have to take the unstructured way I'm thinking in my head and structure that to submit for a prior auth. That's a very manual process. That's what we think about it with when we built Flatiron Assist, we think about how can we take everything that's happening in the doctor's head, not have them type it or dictate it into the great American novel in their note, but have it actually be captured in a useful way so that the, the patient can get the treatment that they need. And there's not a lot of unnecessary and sort of soul killing back and forth between the, uh, you know, the insurance coverer and the physician to try to make things happen. If, if I could jump in before you go to Amy, and I know you're going to do, because from an informatics point of view, I, I work with a gentleman named Dale Sanders. He describes that situation very simply from an informatics point of view is I need to identify for the patients, patients like me who were treated like me, who had outcomes like me. Yep. That's what we're talking about. And that's that's not as easy as it sounds from an informatics point of view. Sorry, Amy. Thanks. No, I think the only thing I would add to that, uh, and the real world example is so compelling, is, is that... You know, again, we're not looking or systems are not actually designed with the patient and the clinical care at the center. And so that variation in how prior authorization is managed from the health payer perspective, I think is a big issue and it needs to be addressed. There's only so much that the clinician can do, but I hear it all the time. Physicians spending countless hours on the phone with you know, a physician at a health plan who has no idea what that specialty is, right? And and they've they're advocating for their patients, which is what you do. Um, but I think we there, and I don't know if this is a policy change or just some, you know, sort of uh, rationalization and an improvement from the payer side of the business. But we need to really look at what is the time that it takes. Totally, not just from the payer 
but for that clinician time to intervene. And is that really the best way to manage authorizations for clinical care? Um, it, it really is in this situation where you see the true DNA of these systems all tracked back to revenue cycle management. Totally. Right? There's yeah. very few of these that were created, you know, as clinical programs because we were the last group of people to jump on board. And so all of these things evolved around us while we were still walking around with the Washington manual in our pockets and, and you know, writing writing on paper, you know, in notes that nobody but myself could read. Um, so you, you see the DNA of these systems. And, and I think it is changing finally to be able to serve both masters. But that's where you see the DNA in this process. Everybody reverts back to its, you know, ancestor. Yeah. yeah well, I think just from a, you know, kind of my, the world I live in at Oracle, which is really kind of connecting sort of the financial and business operations, you know, and clinical, you know, this is an area that we're looking at. Are there ways to, you know, through that kind of connectivity, you know, find ways to streamline that process so that it doesn't, you know, require all the manual machinations. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk a lot at Flatiron and we employ a lot of designers. We talk a lot about user-centered design. And that's mm -hmm. the idea that you get in the clinic with the people actually using the tool at the point of care, the people that actually are most impacted by the experience, which are the patient and the doctor and the care team. Mm -hmm. And you learn what they do and you develop empathy to them and you understand their pain points and their workflows. You know, that is such a priority because practices are at the breaking point. They really are. And they're getting squeezed harder and harder. And anything that gets thrown up that slows them down is a complete disservice. So I, I'm optimistic, Steve, that we have learned this. You know, I, I look back as a clinician at the going, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to have been on paper and you know, now moved to mostly digital. And there was no user centered design happening in, right. the, in the exam room when the first generation of EHRs came out. And yeah. so yeah. I'm optimistic that we're smarter now. It's funny, I think of the analogy uh, very similar to yours. You said a teacher. I, I, I talk to our product teams about our software being, um, it's like a med student, uh, you know, uh, when they present a patient. So we have a very good oral history in medicine of learning how to efficiently present a patient. Um, right now, a lot of software is operating kind of like a third year med student. They tell you not everything you need. They tell you too much of something. Right. They don't they don't they ha they don't have the and now what? Yeah. And they don't and they don't propose a plan. You know, right, we, right, need, right. we need senior fellows. We need software that can act like a senior fellow. It tells you exactly what you need to need. Nothing more. It proposes right. a plan, a high value plan. And then you get to look smart, right? And right. I've used that same true. analogy where it's disjointed the bits of information and no one's putting it together in, in a whole picture. And I fear I dated myself with the Washington Manual reference. I'm right there with you. I think mine's over on the bookcase there. <laughs> you know, and it has to be trusted, right? If we're really looking at tools to support clinical excellence and value, clinicians will only use tools that they trust, right? And, 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 and James hit on it that even something that would seem trivial or small, those things add up. And if they're disruptive to what I'm doing, um, when I when I speak to a group of clinicians and I'm like, I have 18 people to round on and I have 27 minutes at lunch to do it, everyone in the room is like, I've been there, I know what you're talking about. Yep. And it's these little changes that can affect that. Right. Totally. So Amy, you briefly talked about uh, clinical decision support tools and how they need to be trusted. You know, we've heard from, you know, the old school clinicians concerned about these tools taking away from their autonomy and decision making. So how would you respond to clinicians with those kinds of concerns? Can we start with you, Steve? Sure. Um, I would respectfully, I would not dismiss it. But to me, that's like saying a stethoscope is taking away my ability to diagnose murmurs. Right. Not. It's assisting mm -hmm. Um, and as I said before, all of these tools, first of all, no decision support says this is what you're going to do. Get out of the way. Right. Like, no one's designing systems like that. In fact, one of the things, one of, part of my, you know, informatics religion is to merely just suggest things to clinicians, because at the end of the day, that's the human brain that has to be in charge of all this. So there's very little things that should be done autonomously or automatically. And decision support is no different than that. And, you know, I was joking with someone about the single statin that was available. And now there's so many, there's just too much information to expect someone to be able to recall all of it. You know, James was talking about clinical trials to know every clinical trial that's available. What's changed from yesterday? COVID is just a great example of that. 
it was almost impossible to stay on top of every single thing for you know what was changing. And if you don't have um, nimble decision support tools that can that can help you make that decision, we're not looking to these tools to make the decision for us. If it did, it would put us all out of jobs, and everything could be done automatically, you know, by you know by the Star Trek type um, <laughs> a, a physician. Um, we're not we're not there. So we just need tools to assist us to pre present the most relevant data most relevant treatment options and paths that that you know should be considered but at the end of the day it's going to be it's always going to be the clinician who's going to have to make that decision you know it just like you know putting my ear to the patient's chest to go back to the stethoscope, stethoscope analogy is not as effective for listening for murmurs so it's just another tool to assist us to uh, provide quality care yeah that's spot that's spot on i mean you know at the we're not getting replaced anytime soon but you you alluded to the mass of data that people need to know and cancer right now as a general oncologist and i'm sure especially in family practice primary care there's too much to know and so i have the experience of being in clinic and you know on a weekly basis something will come along where I need to be reminded of a new development or breakthrough that is actually really clinic, clinically meaningful and so it's it's being able to surface those things at the right time so the so you know the the busy generalist physician or the specialist can make the best decision and it's totally true steve with any any clinical decision support tool so we when we talk about flat iron assist picking chemotherapy concordance with the pathway should never be a hundred percent it should probably be 85 to 90 percent because there are plenty of edge cases that come into play um, and what you want to make sure of is that your, your, your docs are empowered to be generally concordant with the best available practice. And they're also empowered to, to customize and make decisions that are right for their specific patients. Amy, anything to add? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what I'm hearing too is th this concept of curation and context. I think it's really important for clinical decision support tools to, you know, again, surface and curate the information that may be relevant for the clinician to uh, consider in in the treatment uh, with a, with a particular patient, um, but I think there's another element that I I I think is important where we are right now for clinical decision support tools, and it's really how can how can these tools actually um, support and enable uh, expanding access to care and addressing healthcare equity. And what I mean by that is um, with the proliferation of virtual care and telehealth also being considered as, you know, potentially higher value, um, you know, ways to um, engage with patients. I think there's another element to this. That if you look at kind of the ability for, cool. let's say specialists or in a, in a clinical trial context to collaborate with uh, community-based primary care physicians on a particular cancer patient. That's that's another element that we can look at clinical decision support tools that are flexible enough and have mobile and other kinds of interfaces that could really support that extension of high quality care and clinical trials um, to communities that have traditionally not been part of them. Great. So I want to talk about another element of value-based care, which is not only about having the data, but being able to get insights and analysis on that data so you know you can take action as a clinician in these value-based payment models. So I'd love to hear from each of you of how your organizations are helping um, providers do this. So can we start with you, Steve? Sure. Um, again, let's use COVID as an example because it's so, it's so relevant. Um, if, if we were to fall back on the standard and administrative code sets when, when trying to do either prospective or retrospective analyses, ICD had one code for COVID in the beginning and internationally they had two. Um, we knew there were thousands of ways to describe a patient. And if, if we were going to um, really look at that, we need to be able to, again, allow for all the nuance in medicine. I understand why, you know, ICD, which is truly not a, a clinical vocabulary, it's really just a classification system, and, and, and it serves its purpose very, very well, right? A, a paying model cares about you have reason one, two, or three, you have a different reason, or you have I don't know. That's really how ICD is structured. You're not going to do any true clinical analysis on data based around that type of code set. Um, so a, 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 good, a good system would be able to allow the clinicians to define 
a patient to describe them in as many ways as they wanted to. The criteria for creating a structured clinical term should be, is it not ambiguous and is it relevant? That's it. And relevant to one clinician. And then be able to walk that up to the standard code sets. And then using a combination of everything. SNOMED is a very powerful tool. In its charter, it was never designed for clinical capture. It was designed for the collation and, and, and analysis of clinical data. But it's going to become the world standard for, you know, you know, em, employing some of these, these methods of analysis and, and, and so on. So we need to understand that. But how we get the clinicians, you know, into these code sets is very, very important. So I think that it's, that it's incredibly important, again, to make sure that the systems understand the language of medicine um, and how we use it. James? Yeah, as far as taking data and making it actionable, a couple of things. First of all, as I alluded to before, having visibility as a practice lead into how your docs are practicing to identify the variation in care is just crucial. If you can, if you can define best practices in the common scenarios that come into your clinic, you need a way to measure adherence to best practices. And then you need the granular doctor and patient patient level data to help manage, help physicians to align with best practices when it's appropriate. Um, so returning that to sites of care, I think is a really valuable way to do it. I want to come back to um, what Amy said. A lot of work that we do at Flatiron has been looking at, um, at inequities in care. And so first of all, understanding what your population is from a race and ethnicity standpoint, um, for example, socioeconomic status and social determinants of health, that's a huge opportunity. As we think about rolling out um, decision support tools, being able to incorporate those types of measurements into our workflows and our support tools is a real opportunity. You know, we don't do a very good job as an industry right now of capturing race and ethnic ethnicity in a granular and accurate way. There is a lot of talk about new standards coming out. And so in, in the world that I live in, uh, the Center for Medicare Innovation is, is talking about coming out with new standards for how they're captured in electronic medical records and in CMS payment models. Um, and I think that would drive a lot of technology change and terminology change um, that it would incentivize sites of care to really capture that, do a better job of capturing that. And of course, once we measure it, we can do a better job at using clinical decision support to, to drive health equity. Right. Amy? Well, you're both speaking my language because I think that's the, that's the possibility that we have really to look at not just traditional data, but, but really those social determinants. That's a very exciting part. I'm watching what's going on at CMS around around that, um, but you know when we look at the at kind of the the potential for um, expanding the way that we can capture all the nuances of clinical data, there's a whole element of how do we actually operate. Um, so I, I I'm not going to focus on the clinical decision support tools themselves, but really more um, I'd wanted to share kind of what I'm hearing from. Uh, clinical and C-level leaders in health systems about how, how they're looking at um, data to drive not just operational efficiency, but clinical operations. And interestingly, we, we had, um, you know, some clients, um, you know, did a deep dive on what kind of value did, were they able to derive from, you know, an integrated enterprise, um, you know, infrastructure. And, and, you know, you always, you always used to hear, oh, yeah, we were able to, you know, reduce our um, our costs here or improve our compliance. But what I'm hearing more and more is that they are connecting that integration of data across clinical and and um, business operations as a function of driving operational excellence to meet their missions to and I specifically to in improve patient care to improve uh, the physician experience and to address affordability and access. I've never heard, you know, a CFO talk about that before. And that's, I, I think that, you know, this marrying of kind of the business operations with uh, more kind of clinically uh, relevant tools to enable, um, you know, value-based care, I think we're on the cusp of, of some big changes. That's great. So 
let's move to on to leadership and what role uh, leaders play in the transition to value-based care. So what change management is required when healthcare leaders are looking to implement some of the solutions we've been talking about today? And how can they ensure it's having a meaningful impact? Can we start with you, James? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really crucial. We've, we've talked about tools and software, you know, and strategies to, um, to help improve value-based care. But if it's not, th these are only tools and the implementation and adoption of those tools and the training of those tools um, is crucial. And so what we find when we go to sites of care with some new change in the software or a new product, et cetera, is it's great that the tool has to work. It has to make docs more efficient, et cetera, but there has to be buy-in from a leadership level. And then they have to get buy-in from the, the, the doctors and the teams that are working with them. Because I think it's a healthy thing that doctors and care teams are pretty resistant to change. Um, we don't jump on the first shiny thing that comes along, um, but that inertia can also make it difficult to adopt new technologies and new workflows. And so, um, you know, I've been there making the mistake of trying to just drop a new tool in at a practice and hope that it works. It's really a much more concerted effort over time to get buy-in from, from the leadership and then to have that sort of joint effort of the tool and the adoption implementation strategy to really make it impactful. Steve? Uh, yes, uh, and I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, that we're not, it, it's good that we're not, you know, the first to jump on, we're not at the end of the curve of new adopters. Right. Um, I was, uh, I like to joke, I was sentenced to be a CMIO during Meaningful Use <laughs> One. Um, and you find that you have to balance somewhere between the benevolent dictator and a pure democracy. So it's nice to get buy-in from everyone, um, and, and you know make everybody feel comfortable with what they're doing but there are certain times where you know you just have to say i'm doing this for the good of the of the situation and 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 the the quality leaders the people who who are and i think when you look around this industry every time i'm engaged in a conversation like this or i'm at hymns or amdis or, or or amia um you run into so many people who, who are just putting so much thought into this but there does come come a time where you know the, the, the users, and I think they're doing it. They're, they're trusting the thought leaders in this field to have their best interests at, at heart and then to communicate the why. Why are we doing this? Not just sit and, and put out edict after edict um, of what we're going to do, but why this and how that's going to translate into something useful down the line. And the the misperception is that, you know, doctors are, we're, we're anti-change, we're, you know, we, we don't like computers, we're anti-technology. Nothing could be further from the truth. Go to any doctor's AV room at their house. I guarantee you it's, it's you know, it, it's cutting edge. It's that we need to be we need to be shown that this is going to make our job better, going to make the outcomes better, not going to, you know, backlog my day until we really, you know, decide to adopt something as part of our work. Yeah, the, the rubber meets the road there. You don't know how many times I've gone into a practice and they've said, can you put a hard stop on staging so everyone has to stage their pit? And I'm like, that's your fight. I can put a right. soft stop on it. but, but. Right. Amy, it's really all about value. And I, I think, you know, I think that if we, if the tools are designed with that understanding of demonstrating value to clinicians, to, you know, patient care, we need to start from there, not do it as a, you know, just to address kind of the, the user interface as part of the implementation. So I really think that the kinds of tools that are getting most traction, um, you know, are being led with that understanding of the current challenges that face clinicians in practice and, and this understanding that uh, medicine is both an art and a science. It is evolving. So they can't be these discrete kind of one place in time we have to build ways for clinical decision support tools to reflect the emerging, you know, science and pure, you know, evidence-based research. So I'm hopeful that, I mean, your companies are, are doing this beautifully, but I'm, I'm hoping that that kind of trend continues. So these tools are actually meaningful um, to overall value. So to start to wrap up, I'd love to hear from each of you what you're hopeful about as you look to the future of value-based care. Can we start with you, Steve? Sure. 
to me, this entire discussion is academic if we can't um, prove that we uh, demonstrate that we improve outcomes. Um, and, and obviously the most important outcome is, is clinical outcomes that, that the patients are doing better, but also financial outcomes. No one is, you know, so naive as to not understand that, you know, this is a business and we need to keep the lights on and, you know, we can't operate at a loss continuously, but at the end of the day, are we making the patient's lives better? So otherwise, as I said, this is, this is a purely academic discussion. Um, in theory, um, I, I hope we can, we can get there, but, you know, time will tell, can we deploy these all of these systems both you know the clinical systems technology the administrative world all coming together to you know make the interactions better for the patients these are very difficult situations james being oncology whether it's you know primary care or oncology these are not always comfortable situations for patients to be in the last thing we should do is be making them worse because now we're trying to change the way we operate and so on. if we could improve all of that the interaction the experience, the outcomes, the financial benefit at the end of the day, then it's a win all around and you won't have, you know, you won't have, you know, resistance that, that we see. I, I'm hopeful that we can get there um, and and it, it will be interesting to see how this evolves over the next, you know, several years to decades. James? Yeah, I agree. I think the patient centricity of it is something that all of the stakeholders are recognizing. So regulators, payers, Obviously, clinicians and patients and, and life sciences companies are, are doubling down on that. You know, I, I think value-based care and all this ex exploration we're doing with these models are going to allow us to understand what high quality care means. And that is basically measured in patient experience and patient outcome. They're going to allow us to understand what low quality care is and really put some definitions on it. If we can, under, and they're also gonna understand, or allow us to understand the value. So if you think of a two by two table where up in one, the quadrant you wanna be in is the high quality, high value, you know, high quality, lower cost. The, the one you don't wanna be in is the low quality, low value. As we begin to define these and look at practices and which quadrant they fall into, we're gonna understand what are the characteristics of high quality, high value care. And we're gonna be able to drive people to that quadrant. And I think it's not happening tomorrow. Um, but I think we're making progress and and I'm an optimist that we're going to, to get there. Amy. I'm an optimist too, and I never thought I would say that because, you know, those of us who've been working for decades to try and, you know, um, push for more kind of value-based care, we've seen a lot of efforts from CMS and um, large employer purchasers, but they never really gained traction. And what gives me hope is that what I saw is this massive, you know, disruptor of the pandemic has actually accomplished giving us some traction and accelerating a lot of these trends, not just around total cost of care, but meaningfully shifting how and where, you know, uh, clinical practice happens, how we engage with patients. So I think that that kind of trend is very exciting to me um, and gives me hope. Uh, but it also kind of opens up, as, as James, you talked about, it also allows us to, to look at what other kinds of uh, sort of just what other kinds of um, inefficiencies and inequities have been further revealed by the pandemic. And this is the first time that I've, I've really heard um, in our industry a focus and an intention to, to, as we sort of shift our models of care and payment, to really look at addressing systemic healthcare disparities um, and, ex, you know, looking at ways to uh, not just extend access, but to elevate the health of, of communities and individual patients. So that's exciting for me. That's a great that's segue a great to the too. last question, which was about the pandemic. So. We're making our way out of this year's long pandemic. What were the lessons for each of you as you helped organizations during this time and as it relates to value-based care? I can start. Would you like to, oh, go ahead, James. Yeah, I, I can start. I mean, there, there is a lot, obviously, and there's a lot that I think we all know we need to still learn from this. The one, the one thing I'll take away, um, the speed with which practices adopted telehealth once it was made viable by some of the payment changes. Um, I was very proud of CMS for, for making the payment changes to enable telehealth. And then I was super impressed by the speed at, with, at which it was adopted by practices. Now, 
we know, and we have some, some data that we're actually presenting at ASCO next week from Flatiron, that there were inequities there too with uptake of, uptake of telehealth. But I think what that showed me, you know, tell, there are, I think telehealth will persist in some capacity. There obviously are scenarios where it makes a ton of sense for a patient um, to not have to take off work and come in, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, not for everyone all the time. Um, but I was really impressed that when things are incentivized, um, the, the system, which we think of as slow moving, can actually move pretty quickly. So that makes me an optimist. If we can get our policies you know, changes, if we can make data-driven policy changes and incentivize the right things, people will be able to respond. Steve? Um, I was going I was gonna expound on the theme of speed as well, speed and agility. Um, not just in, in telehealth is a great example, but knowledge of the of the of the pathology, knowledge of treatment, knowledge of what was working, what was not. It was changing, if not week to week, day to day, hour to hour. And the ability to get that information out there to people so that they could effectively diagnose, treat, follow, disseminate information. I was I was very impressed. It took a little bit of time at the beginning for us to wrap our heads around what was happening. Um, but I think very, very quickly as an industry, I was also very proud at the at the speed and agility in which we were able to um, adapt to this unprecedented. I mean, we've had pandemics in the past, but it never merged with a situation where we had the technology to actually move on it that that quickly. And it was just it was an impressive thing to, to watch people come together uh, and, and achieve something that I think was remarkable. And then Amy, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna echo the, you know, agility and speed. And I would say um, sort of fearlessness by some of, to just uh, lean in and, and try to address the challenges in, in flight. Um, we worked with a lot of our customers, um, you know, one in particular in, in Northwell in, in New York and and I just want to make a connection between sort of clinical care and, you know, operational infrastructure. They had, what, 21 hospitals in the middle of the pre-vaccine, you know, pandemic. And, you know, we were able to work with them to break down some of those data silos so that they could match um, patient census data and predictive, you know, predictions about where the, um, you know, the, the virus was going to hit in, in within their their regions, and then surface data on um, clinician availability and scheduling. So to map and flex across their system to ensure they had the clinicians in place uh, to meet the need um, of the patient population. And so that's kind of like just a way I think you know previously they were just doing this manually, right? But it was an it was a a, a kick in the pants to say, maybe that's not acceptable in this situation. And those are the kinds of high value operational uh, improvements that I think are going to stick. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, each of you for your time, Amy, James, and Steve. I really enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you great, so great conversation. Thanks everyone. Thanks. And uh, to our sponsors, Flatiron Health, Intelligent Medical Objects, and Oracle, thank you. For more information about our sponsors, please check out the conference booklet and our microsite. To our audience, thanks for tuning in today, and please enjoy the rest of our conference.